clings to Detective David Tapp as he exits the car. He straightens his shoulders and sucks in a deep breath, but he knows it's still there. In his eyes, they always betray him. The stroll up the sidewalk to Mr. and Mrs. Serenko's home is brief. He wishes he could stretch it out, take each step slower than the last, but this was his choice. He volunteered to tell them their missing son, Shane, is dead. Should have taken the vacation. Could be on the beach frying up slabs of meat. What the hell was I thinking? He was so close to getting on that plane. At the airport waiting to board, his wife's hand reaches out, locks her fingers around his, squeezes tight. He squeezes back without thinking. In his other hand is the coroner's report on the Jigsaw Killer's latest victim. He promises he'll only glance over it, then stow it for the rest of the week. Female, 37 years old, fragment of a drill bit found in the wound on her hip. Unconventional design, custom made for a company that went belly up in the 80s. Tap remembers the company's logo, grew up a few blocks from their factory. Could the place still be abandoned? It's too important to leave to someone else. He can cancel the plane tickets, take the loss, and try again in a few days. He turns to tell his wife. A tear streams down her face before he even opens his mouth. It sounds like someone else's voice when he says it. Your son Shane is dead. There's an outpouring of emotion on the parents' faces. Shock, devastation, agony. Too much for a single word. It's as if they're cycling through trauma with each second, pouring it from their bodies in howls and cries. Tap stands and waits, tries to ignore the discomfort, reminds himself that what they're going through is far worse. He's a spectator, torn between offering condolences and leaving them to their grief. Either choice lacks sincerity. All these years and he still doesn't know what to do. No one ever does. The father screams, and it reminds him of Shane. It brings him back to where it started, as memories from hours past take over. He remembers it clearly. He arrives at the factory. It's abandoned. He snoops around, checking for signs of forced entry. Twenty minutes pass. No footprints, broken windows, or snapped fences. A nagging doubt starts from the back of his mind and pushes forward. Left your wife behind to trounce around an empty lot in some old as shit building? This is one hell of a vacation. There's an apology forming somewhere, but it sounds no different than the past few. Still, better put something together before he heads home. She's had hours to talk to her mom, and that woman will fan the flames just to watch him choke on the smoke. Get some flowers, or too cliché? Yeah. Well past the point of floral arrangements counting as a get-out-of-jail-free card. Anyway, there's no... A sudden noise. A scream? It was barely audible. In a range that makes him question if his mind is playing tricks on him. Hold up. Don't rush this one. Take a close... Ah, screw it. He needs to be right about this. Close the case so we can go home, tell her it's over, he's sorry, he messed up, he's a bastard, that's behind him. He'll make it right, just stick around, he'll make it right. Shoulder up, he takes a running start and slams into a rickety door. Mrs. Serenko asks him to come in and talk over tea. He'd rather find a bar stool and a place to hang his head. Somewhere where only a waitress will interrupt. He wants nothing more than to decline the invitation. Of course, anything I can do. I'm happy to stay and talk. He settles onto a dusty couch, letting his tea go cold on the side table, chai spice. Wife used to make it for him when they started dating. Didn't like it then either, but he'd drink it anyway. It made her happy. Maybe it made him happy too. Hearing the kettle whistle, sipping at a teacup, seemed like the kind of thing married people do. Can't remember when she stopped serving it. Shane's parents smile between tears 
as they recount stories of their son. Every now and then, reality hits and one of them chokes up, excusing him or herself for a minute. Tap moves his hand alongside his radio, hoping that a voice on the other end requests his help. Mrs. Serenko dabs her eyes as she recalls the last year of Shane's life. Such a gentle boy, that one. He was brokenhearted over his fiancé leaving. Wanted to make things right with her, but never really did. She just kind of got away. And he fell apart, dropped out of college, drifted day to day without a path to stand on. Never really recovered. Stopped living, I guess. Lost that sparkle. Tap reacts with a consoling look, but inside... He's mentally recording the information for his report. Testing those who have given up on life, it fits Jigsaw's M.O. Shane lost his will and abandoned his future. That's some kind of sin in this madman's book. The sick asshole strapped the poor kid into a trap to teach him a lesson. Discomfort being necessary to mend a broken heart? Could be. At this point, he knows Jigsaw better than he knows anyone. Ah. Shit anyone. He tries to rattle the thought from his head, find some other memory to torture himself on. Mrs. Serenko's voice in the background decides for him. Shane. He had the chance to save him, and he blew it. The scene plays over again in his head, beating against his skull like a bad hangover. His eyes adjust to the darkness of the abandoned factory, Slivers of light pierce the gaps in the boarded-up windows. Stale air fills his lungs. He paces forward, moves between a row of shelves, looks to the floor, sees footprints in the thick dust. With a calm, steady movement, he unholsters his gun, stops, listens, waits to see if the intruder will give himself away. Nothing but silence. Takes another step forward and... Metal screeches on the concrete floor. The shelf beside Tap leans towards him, looming tall, heavy. Adrenaline takes over. Time appears to slow. For a millisecond, he intercepts a thought intended for his subconscious. Will she cry when they tell her I'm d- Neurons fire for one singular purpose. Jump. Shift weight. Push off. Extend arms. Brace for impact. He hits the ground hard. A deafening crash echoes around him. He looks back to see the shelf collapsed where he was a split second ago, his gun pinned beneath it. Footsteps barrel along the floor. A cloaked figure flees into the shadows. Tap jumps to his feet and gives chase. He sprints after the fleeing figure, trying to catch a glimpse beyond their cloak. He shouts to stop, knowing it's futile, but... Mr. Tap? Officer? He's abruptly pulled from his thoughts. Mrs. Serenko patiently holds a photo out to him. He doesn't want to see it. He'd rather turn his attention to his tea, take a cold sip and stare at residue swimming along the bottom. He knows he can't. As much as the guilt rises in his throat like bile, he knows he has to play his role in this ritual. He takes the photo. A young Shane, dressed for prom, smiles at him. A bright, eager grin. But what Tap sees quickly fades until all that's there is a murdered boy, pain and fear etched onto his face. Then he remembers. There was something else in Shane's eyes when he first saw him. Hope. The belief that maybe he would be saved. That one hurts most. Tap chases the cloaked figure into a dimly lit room, electronic beeps ringing out as he enters. He stumbles nearly freezing in shock at what's before him. A terrified young man stands 15 feet away, metal hooks piercing his back and arms, keeping him from moving. A jackhammer is propped in front of him, chained and locked to his neck and torso, its tip pointing into the left side of his chest. On the wall behind him is the picture of a heart, broken in two. A timer counts down. 45 seconds. Shane screams, stretching for a ring of keys dangling in front of him, hooks ripping at his back and arms. Blood trickles down his body. Tap runs to him. Hold on, kid. Breathe. Breathe. 
Don't move. Tap grabs the keyring, picks a key at random, shoves it into the lock around Shane's neck, forces it. Nothing. Grabs another. Useless. Hands shake, looks at the timer. Another one. No luck. Footsteps patter along the concrete. The cloaked figure emerges from the shadows and makes a run for it. There's still time to catch them. Shane screams, his hurried breath making his words incoherent. Tap looks back to him. Damn, hold still. Almost got you. Another key that won't work. Or was that the one he tried before? That can't be right. Which? The cloaked figure races towards an emergency exit. There's no time for Tap to think. Tap stands at the front door as Mrs. Serenko puts a hand on his shoulder, offering him a sad smile. She thanks him for being with Shane in his final moments, for providing what comfort and support he could. I know that made a difference for him. Shane never did well with being alone. Tap's mouth dries out, heart drops into his stomach. He tries to form a word, but only clears his throat. He nods and hopes that's enough. Pulling his jacket on, he turns, tries to find his footing as he paces away from the house, the walk longer than he remembers. He wants to shout, or collapse silently, maybe both. He reaches for his phone, scrolls to his wife's number. This was the routine. Call her. Tell her it was a rough night. He'd bring home ramen, maybe some beer, stay up, talk, watch reruns on TV, wake up on the couch wondering who fell asleep first. His thumb hovers over the send button, but he can't bring himself to press it. Too late for that. No matter where she is, she's gone. Long gone. Just him and Jigsaw now. The realization shakes him. The burden pushes down, unconfessed unconsoled. Without her, the memory of what really happened to Shane burrows in and festers.